Among the brutal violence, bombastic music, and bright scenery of Hotline Miami is a minor trait that isn't as prevalent as the previously mentioned ones, but its impact is just as powerful. The subversion of expectations. Here's an example. You're controlling the henchman for the first time. After Sun gives you your mission, you go to leave just like you've always done, but for some reason can't get the car door open. You're kind of dumbfounded for a second, and that's when it hits you. This isn't the henchman's car. That is. This is what I'm talking about. The game built up an expectation where after the intro to every level, you walk to a vehicle, which typically sits right by the door outside, to actually get to the stage. In this case, the game subverted that expectation by deliberately placing the henchman's car past Sun's car on the far side of the lot, leaving the players dumbfounded for a moment before they realize what's going on. Moments like this fill the Hotline Miami series and their uses fulfill various purposes. In the case of the henchman, it serves to point out key differences between himself and Sun. The extravagant car closest to the door belongs to the boss, as it rightly should, while the servant's car isn't as fabulous and sits further from the door. One car is for the master, and the other is for the servant, and this helps establish the relationship between Sun and the henchman. It also demonstrates that there's a gap in wealth between the characters, a point that comes full circle later on in the henchman's story when he takes money that should go to Sun for himself. Character moments like this are scattered throughout the game and help craft the compelling characters of the series. Look at Richter. For most of Hotline Miami, he's built up as an aggressive man that loves violence, but when finally confronted, he's apologetic towards Jacket, subverting our expectation that he's a savage killer. His portrayal later on in Hotline Miami 2 reinforces the idea that he's a peaceful man, but he's willing to do whatever's necessary in order to protect his loved ones, and he eventually becomes a reluctant participant in the masked maniac killings. The subversion of our idea of Richter helps deepen his development, making him more memorable than just a psycho killer. These moments can also create interesting situations that keep players on edge. For example, in Scene 2 of Hotline Miami 2, we're introduced to Manny Pardo, who, after leaving a diner, makes his way to a store where he kills everybody inside. As he goes to leave, there are armed cops crowded around the door, waiting for someone from inside to emerge. The potential for this standoff fills our heads with questions. What are these cops going to do to the guy that just murdered everybody inside? How is Pardo going to get out of this situation? Just when we expect there's going to be a dramatic showdown, Manny Pardo flashes a badge, revealing he's a detective, quickly dispelling the situation and leaving us bewildered. While we believed that there was danger in the situation, the game subverted our expectation, and Pardo drives off scot-free. But later, the game makes masterful use of this moment. In scene 23, Pardo fights his way out of the police station, massacring fellow officers along the way and again crowded outside the front door are a bunch of armed officers waiting for Pardo to emerge. This sets up a similar situation to scene 2, and we're left asking the same questions as before, but with the benefit of a baseline. The game showed us before that Pardo is able to flash his badge and talk his way out of the situation, but this time, the game shatters that presumption, and Pardo is gunned down in front of the station. Yet this moment is not only subverting our current expectation, it's fulfilling our initial belief from the setup from scene 2, giving us a dose of dramatic irony to go along with our subversion. But perhaps the best example of this tactic comes at the end of Hotline Miami. After Jackie completes his revenge and the credits roll, we expect the game to be over. But the game surprises us once again and enters a new part to its story. Part 5. Answers. With this title, the game is promising to answer our questions, and starts by rewinding back in time and giving us a new character to control, Biker, the man whom Jacket killed in Chapter 7. We find that he's also been involved in the mass maniac killings and wants to get out. He interrogates a man in a Chinese restaurant, and it's revealed that the calls are routed through a system set up at phone home so they can't be traced unless their system is hacked. That means when the police were investigating the calls and traced them to the golden truck stop, they weren't finding the true source of the calls. 
This is the information that Jacket and by extension the players read in the police report and that led him to the wrong place. He didn't find out where the calls really came from, but now Biker has an opportunity to find the truth. After completing one more job for the callers and being harassed by them, he finally makes his way to the phone home headquarters to find the source of the calls. This building should look familiar to the players, for it's the very building Jack and Biker fought in earlier in the game. And indeed, after Biker hacks a computer and finds an address, Jacket saunters in, having been ordered by the callers to kill Biker. We, the players, know how this fight plays out, since we saw it earlier, and we expect a vicious fight as a result. But we know Jacket has to run for that golf club in the corner, so as the conversation ends, we charge the golf bag in order to get some damage in on Jacket before a difficult boss fight. But again, our expectations don't line up with reality, and Jacket goes down easily in one hit. This catches us off guard, and even after Biker stomps Jacket's head in, we're left questioning what happened. We thought we knew what was going to happen based on our earlier experience, but the game surprised us, keeping us on our toes. But we realize we can now find the answers the game promised us, so we carry on, and the next day, Biker heads to the address he found to find that the calls were coming from two janitors who set up some kind of operation in the basement of their hideout. Biker confronts them to finally get the answers we've been waiting for, and instead, the janitors don't give any, again subverting the expectations of the player. This time, Biker, and by extension the player, is mocked for expecting to find answers, and they're left with the empty words of the janitors. However, the players can decipher a puzzle that gets more information out of the janitors, but even with this information, they're left with more questions than answers. Like, who are 50 Blessings? And what's the Russo-American Coalition? How is 50 Blessings going to shape the country in their image by toppling this coalition? And what is their image of America? And besides, what really happened in the fight between Jack and Biker? Who's the one that won? All of these questions left for the player bring up one more. Why name the final part of Hotline Miami answers if all it was going to do was pose more questions? Well, by building up the expectation that answers are going to be provided and then playing with that expectation, Denitin threw players off completely and left them with an enticing mystery to decipher, investing them into the story more than ever. These subversions are a big part of what makes the story of Hotline Miami so compelling. They captivate us and keep us invested in playing the game to see the story out to its end. Denitin are truly masters of using this technique, yet at the same time, they try to warn us of our own expectations. The character Richard appears several times throughout the games, and at times, warns of the future and what it holds. Yet, we don't listen to him. And when we continue playing, we are shocked when things don't fall in line with our expectations. It just goes to show, in Hotline Miami, it's not the story that tricks the players. It's the players that trick themselves. Thank you for watching and see you later. Released in March of 2018, A Way Out took a bold new stance on cinematic storytelling in games. To give a super brief synopsis, the game is about two men, Vincent and Leo, who meet in prison. 